Okay, so let's discuss the laboratory that we're working on today. And so we'll be doing an overview of the bleach laboratory. So what exactly is bleach? Bleach is sodium hypochlorite. Just one moment. Sodium hypochlorite. The active species is our hypochlorite. ion. That is the active oxidizing agent in bleach. So the way that bleach is made commercially is by taking chlorine in the presence of hydroxide under electrolysis. So we're running a current through our mixture. We generate hypochlorite, chloride, and water. This is a redox reaction where in effect chlorine is being oxidized to hypochlorite and we're losing one electron each time. So for each chlorine atom, we're going from zero to plus one. And as a result, one times two gives us two electrons lost total. On the flip side, um, chlorine is also being, so chlorine is oxidized in this first half reaction, in this oxidation half reaction, and then chlorine is being reduced to chloride in our reduction half reaction. So chlorine is gaining two electrons, one per each chlorine, chlorine atom, to generate two equivalents of chloride. When we add our equations together, we see clearly that our electrons cancel and are conserved in this redox reaction. Perfect. We can simplify our coefficients and we get the following equation. So chlorine reacts with two equivalents of hydroxide to generate hypochlorite, chloride, and water. We call this a disproportionation reaction because we have one chlorine atom going to an oxidation state of plus one, while the second chlorine atom goes to an oxidation state of minus one. It's where two atoms found in the same molecule, one of which is oxidized, the other which is reduced during the chemical reaction. These are pretty cool reactions to study. Now, we can express the amount of chlorine or effective chlorine equivalents in our sample by in terms of the amount of hypochlorite in our sample. So the available chlorine equivalents essentially for every one mole of hypochlorite, for every one mole of hypochlorite that we have in our solution, we have used one mole of chlorine to generate that hypochlorite. So for every one mole of hypochlorite, we have one mole of chlorine equivalents. So by measuring the grams or moles of hypochlorite in our sample, we can determine the chlorine equivalents. And our goal in this process is to calculate the percent mass over mass of chlorine in our bleach sample which is the grams of chlorine equivalent, which is best thought of just as the grams of chlorine, over the grams of solution. And we can get the mass of the solution by taking the density times the volume. We've done this time and time again. Now, let's try to answer the question, how will we find the moles of hypochlorite in a bleach sample? So we're going to use the methods of redox titration and iodometry. So titration, we've seen that before, and we'll be drawing heavily behind the theory for titration. So if you want a refresher, please look at the pre-lab lectures or our titration laboratories that we performed earlier on this semester. In iodometry, you're using a defined reaction with iodide in this case to generate iodine. So we're using the following well-defined half reaction. Okay, and we are using the reaction of iodide with an oxidizing agent to determine the concentration of our unknown reactive species via titration of iodine. So essentially we can think of it as step one, react to make iodine. Step two, we titrate the iodine generated. Perfect. So, in terms of how bleach reacts with iodide anion, 
hypochlorous acid, since this reaction is run under acidic conditions for this half reaction, hypochlorous acid oxidizes iodide to make iodine and our hypochlorous acid, the chlorine is reduced to chloride. So looking at our half reactions, we have iodide going to iodine. iodine. And the beautiful thing about iodine is that it has this beautiful brown color. So I2 is easy to detect. So just like how we used an indicator in previous titration labs, iodine shows you this brilliant color if it's present and the color disappears when you've used up all of your iodine. So it's pretty easy to titrate and iodine itself is relatively stable. For a reduction half reaction, our hypochlorous acid under acidic conditions picks up two electrons to make chloride and we generate an equivalent of water as a byproduct. Note, electrons are conserved in both cases. These are two electron redox processes. If we add our reactions together, um, we get the equation up here, and we again can establish a stoichiometric relationship between the moles of iodine generated and the moles of hypochlorite in solution. And as we see, looking at our equation, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. We have one mole of iodine generated for every one mole of hypochlorite. So the moles of hypochlorite are equal to the moles of iodine determined via titration. Perfect. So we have this link between the iodine that we've generated from reaction with our hypochlorite and the amount of hypochlorite originally present in our solution. Perfect. So we're going to be titrating iodine as it has some really wonderful benefits. First, it's colored. It's easy to detect, it's relatively stable, and iodine in the presence of iodide, which we have an excess of, makes the triiodide anion. And in the presence of starch, you make this blue starch iodine complex, and it allows the, the trace amounts of iodine to be accurately detected. So essentially the iodine starch complex is self-indicating. When the color, when the color disappears, the end point is reached. And I2 completely reacted. Okay, so how are, what are, what are we gonna use to titrate our iodine? Well, we're gonna break out our sodium thiosulfate. And thiosulfate, thiosulfate, we need two equivalents of thiosulfate to react with one equivalent of iodine to generate two equivalents of iodide and this dimeric oxidized anion. So for our oxidation half reaction, um, we're going for an oxidation number of plus two for sulfur to an oxidation number of five over two in S4O6. If we note the fact that we're going from essentially plus two to plus 2.5 four times for our four sulfur atoms, we see that we have in turn lost two electrons in this cycle. For our reduction half reaction, again, just like before, iodine is being reduced to iodide by gaining two electrons. We establish now a relationship looking at our above chemical equation that for every one mole of iodine, we need two moles of thiosulfate for a complete reaction. Okay, one thing I want you to recall and to add to our list of relationships, we know that we have one mole of hypochlorite in solution for every one mole of iodine that we generate. Additionally, we know that we have one mole of effective chlorine equivalents for every one mole of hypochlorite present in solution. So we're gonna use all of these relationships in our titration to essentially go from, we're, we're essentially going to go from moles of thiosulfate to moles of iodine, to moles of hypochlorite, to moles of chlorine. So this is our one line conversion factor setup.
So we're going to titrate a sample of both solid and liquid bleach with thiosulfate solution. So in terms of our procedure, we're going to take a known volume of bleach, we're going to record the mass, and we will figure out the density by taking the mass of bleach over the volume. We're going to dilute our sample of bleach by a factor of 10. So using our dilution equation, essentially we're taking 10 mils of bleach to 100 mils total volume, and we know the molarity of our concentrated sample is equal to the molarity of our dilute sample times 10. Essentially, our dilute sample is 10 times less concentrated. We, that way, we're not spending hours and hours dispensing thiosulfate. We're then going to react and titrate 25 mils of dilute bleach with potassium iodide under acidic condition. Remember, hypochlorite, which is the active agent of bleach, reacts with iodide to make iodine. We'll see this beautiful brown color. And then we're going to titrate our iodine with a standard solution of sodium thiosulfate. Now, looking at our reaction stoichiometry, so if we're performing the titration, we'll record our volume initial from our barrette. Then we're going to add thiosulfate until we observe this yellow color for dilute iodine. So dilute iodine has this yellow color. Then, and only then, are we going to add our starch, and we're going to observe the blue color of the starch iodine complex. After additional thiosulfate, we will observe a clear solution, which is the end point for our titration. And at that point, we'll record the volume final. Now, looking at our chemical equation, we know at the end point, which is about the same as the equivalent point, the moles of iodine and the moles of thiosulfate are present in the stoichiometric ratio. So for our moles of thiosulfate, we know that for complete reaction, based on our stoichiometry, we have one mole of iodine reacting with every two moles of thiosulfate. So from this, we can calculate the moles of iodine. If we expand out this moles of thiosulfate using molarity times volume, we see that the moles of iodine are equal to the molarity of our thiosulfate times the volume of thiosulfate times our stoichiometric ratio. And once we figure out the moles of iodine, we can then use our previously established relationship to figure out the moles of hypochlorite. Once we know we get generated one, for every one mole of iodine that we make, we've reacted one mole of hypochlorite that was originally in our bleach sample. For the moles of chlorine equivalents, we know that for every one mole of hypochlorite, we have one mole of chlorine equivalents reacted in solution for every one mole of hypochlorite that we detect in our bleach sample. So, to account for the fact that we did a dilution, if we want to calculate the mass of bleach, we know that we took 25 mils of dilute bleach. And since it's a one to 10 ratio, our 25 mils of dilute bleach are equivalent in moles to 2.5 mils of concentrated bleach because we did a one to 10 dilution. And you can prove this by solving the equation moles is equal to molarity times volume and showing that the moles are only equal in these two samples if the volume of concentrated bleach is 10 times less. Okay, so we can go, now that if we want to calculate our percentage of chlorine, we can calculate the mole, we can calculate the grams of chlorine by just taking the moles times the molar mass. To calculate the grams of solution, we take the volume of our solution times the density, which we measured previously. This is why you measure, this is why you measure the mass of a known volume of bleach. So you can figure out the exact mass of solution that you titrated and the exact mass of solution that contains our effective chlorine equivalents. Once you have these two numbers established, you can just calculate the percentage of chlorine by taking the grams of chlorine over the grams of solution. Now, and this is important, for our solid sample, there's a bit of a catch. We're putting five grams of solid into 100 mils of total volume in our volumetric flask, and we're only taking 25 mils. 
So in effect, we have five grams over 100 mils, and we're only taking 25. So effectively, we're titrating only 1.25 grams of solid. This is, this is the effective amount of solid bleach that we're titrating in that 25 milliliters. So then, when you calculate your percentage of chlorine, you take your grams of chlorine over 1.25 grams of solid. Not too bad. Now, this is where we run into an unfortunate catch, and this is where we'll spend the first half of our experiment today, actually. We need to standardize our sodium thiosulfate because thiosulfate can get wet, it can decompose over time. It, it, you really want to know the concentration of your standard solution as accurately as possible. So we're gonna titrate it with potassium iodate, which is a redox standard. Now, if we simplify our redox equation just a little bit, we end up with the following simplified redox equation in terms of iodine. I personally don't like seeing triiodide in my equations because it masks a little bit about what's going on with the oxidation number of iodine. Okay, so looking at our chemical equation, when we take iodide and react it with iodate, again, this is another iodometry reaction. We're using a defined reaction with iodide to make iodine and we're gonna titrate our iodine to figure, out the, to figure out the amount of iodate in solution. And we're gonna use that to standardize our thiosulfate. So we see that we have three moles of iodine generated per every one mole of iodate. Now, we're gonna be making a 100 mils of 0 0.01 molar potassium iodate, and we're only gonna be titrating 25 milliliters of that solution. So as a result, we can figure out the moles of iodate ion in solution by looking at the molarity times volume. So N is equal to molarity times volume. You're going to have to, as an exercise on your own, determine the grams of potassium iodate necessary to make this 0 0.01 molar solution. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics now. Once we have our iodate in solution, we're gonna add potassium iodide and sulfuric acid. We're gonna generate iodine and we'll titrate with sodium thiosulfate just like before. The only thing you're gonna to have to do in this experiment is record the volume of thiosulfate added to reach the endpoint. This is where the color disappears. And then we can figure out the moles of potassium iodate added by taking molarity times volume. The moles of iodine that we'd expect to generate are equal to the moles of potassium iodate times our stoichiometry, which is three to one. And now to figure out the moles of thiosulfate that we added, if we don't know the concentration of thiosulfate, we'll calculate the moles of thiosulfate from the moles of iodine. So we know for every mole of iodine, we need two moles of thiosulfate. Wonderful. Once we have the moles of thiosulfate, we can get the molarity by taking the moles of thiosulfate over the volume. Now the titration should be done fast as iodide reacts with air. So this is why you'll see I often do the titration really quickly because I don't want my iodide reacting with air and generate excess iodine that shouldn't be present in the solution as this will affect the accuracy of your results. So that concludes our pre-lab lecture for the bleach laboratory and you're now ready to watch the lab video and record data and observations. Okay, so continuing on with our procedure, we're gonna need to transfer 25 milliliters of our potassium iodate solution into an Erlenmeyer flask for titration. So first and foremost, we are going to condition our volumetric pipette that we're going to use for transfer. So we're going to draw in a small volume of liquid. Then we're going, 
So we, we've drawn in a small volume of liquid and now just like we did for our just like we did for our barrette, we are going to swirl the liquid throughout the walls and attempt to coat the inner walls of our pipette. We're then going to drain our liquid and we're going to repeat this conditioning process. And we'll resume once I've conditioned our pipette three times. Okay, now that our pipette is conditioned, we're going to fill our pipette with 25 milliliters of sodium thio oh, sorry, 25 milliliters of potassium iodate solution. Got a little bit ahead of myself there. The sodium thiosulfate is the solution in our barrette. So we're going to transfer 25 milliliters of potassium iodate solution. Okay, so as you notice, the 25 milliliter mark is not past the tip. So we're going to dispense and drain our solution from the zero line all the way down to the 25 milliliter mark, but not past that mark. So just to show everyone that we are currently at the zero mark with the bottom of the meniscus, there we go. And now let's transfer our solution into our Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, perfect. The bottom of our, our meniscus is, is, is exactly touching the 25 milliliter mark. And now we'll resume once we talk about how we process this solution to begin our titration. Okay, so in order to begin to process our solution, first and foremost, we're going to need to add two grams of our prepared potassium iodide. Now, the potassium iodide will react with the oxidizing agent, which is our potassium iodate, and we will generate iodine. This reaction really works best under acidic conditions, so currently I'm swirling just to dissolve my potassium iodide. Now, this reaction, we are on a bit of a, bit of a timer here, because the moment I add my sulfuric acid, the moment I add my acid, it will facilitate the redox reaction, and you'll see a rapid color change as we generate iodine. So the moment I add my sulfuric acid to the solution, the potassium iodide and potassium iodate will react. They'll generate iodine. We'll then titrate the iodine, and the dark brown color will slowly disappear. And when the solution becomes yellowish, when we have a very small amount of iodine, we are going to add our starch. And the starch will form a complex with the I3 minus anion, which is essentially a proxy for the concentration of iodine. And we will titrate the solution until the blue color of our starch iodine complex disappears. And that is the end point for our titration. That is when the moles of sodium thiosulfate added match 
the moles of iodine present in the solution. And by calculating the moles of iodine that we've generated, we can in turn calculate the moles of potassium iodate in our initial 25 milliliter solution. Okay, I know, it's a lot of stuff to keep in mind, but I'm explaining this now because once I add my sulfuric acid, um, I'm gonna be working very quickly. Okay, so let's add our sulfuric acid. And lo and behold, the beautiful color of iodine appears. Now, the reason why we have to work quickly is because iodide will also react. Iodide will also react with air, oxygen, under ambient acidic conditions. So we don't want to generate extra iodine in solution just because we're sitting around letting our iodide react with oxygen. So that's why you have to titrate relatively efficiently. Okay, so we're going to continue to add and swirl our solution. As you notice, the dark brown color is disappearing and it's becoming lighter and lighter. We're doing this with a brisk dropwise pace. Now, I always just want to mention your first titration is always going to be your least accurate. You're mainly just getting a sense of what volume of sodium thiosulfate solution do you need to add in order to provoke the equivalence point or end point in this case. So once the solution turns yellow, then I'm going to add the starch. I'm um, not taking any final volume readings yet, just continuing to allow dropwise addition. As I'm unsure what, vol what total volume I'd need, I have an estimate. I'm going a little bit slowly, just so that way this first run has some value. Okay, the color is getting lighter and lighter. Okay, now that we have this yellowish color, we're going to wash down our drop. And then I'm going to take my starch solution that I've also carefully prepared, and I'm going to transfer my starch solution. And now we see the beautiful blue color of the starch iodine complex. So now we're going to add and continue our dropwise addition. Okay, and as you notice, the color is beginning to fade. So we are very, very, very close to our end point. So we're gonna do the half drop method. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and get around the smallest volume possible. So we're going to open the stopcock slightly, allow one drop to fall, stir. I've cut it off so now half a drop is sitting in the tip of the barrette and I'm going to rinse it down And now I'm going to swirl. There we go. So we got very, very close. We made a small mistake in that um, we likely went about almost half. We went about half a drop over. But overall, this is a pretty good run. As, as long as you're within about half a drop, your results are going to be relatively reproducible. So uh, now that we've reached the end point, the beautiful blue color has disappeared. We've completely reacted all of the iodine that we've generated. Let's now record our final volume.
OK, so please take your final volume measurement and I'll also be taking a picture and posting that picture on Canvas for trial one. OK, so now that our first solution has been completely titrated, um, I'm going to use the same barrette and what we're going to do is we're going to pick up right where we left off. So I'd like you to record our initial volume. One moment. Hmm, it's not being cooperative. Let's record our initial volume. And I'll also take a picture and post the picture on Canvas. Here we go. So please take your initial volume reading for titration trial 2 where we're standardizing our sodium thiosulfate. And I'll also take a picture right now. Okay, so just like before, we're now ready to start trial number two. So let's get out our potassium iodate solution. I already conditioned my pipette, so I don't even have to do the conditioning step again. So let's just transfer 25 mils of the 0.01 molar potassium iodate solution into our Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, so now we're going to drain to the 25 mark. Okay, perfect. The bottom of our meniscus is at the 25 mark. And now we'll resume once we talk about processing our solutions. Okay, so we've already recorded our initial volume reading. Now what we're going to do is we are going to transfer again 2 grams of solid potassium iodide and 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid. Okay, so let's add our solid potassium iodide. Okay, let's swirl to dissolve. And now let's generate our iodine that we're titrating. Let's initiate the reaction between potassium iodide and potassium iodate via addition of sulfuric acid. And as we can see, we see the beautiful color of iodine. And now we are ready to titrate the solution. Remember, we are on a clock here. We have to work efficiently to avoid generation of excess iodine via reaction with oxygen. So. We knew previously that it took somewhere around 14 milliliters, so we can be pretty aggressive with our, we can be pretty aggressive with how quickly we dispense.
So I'd expect us to start to see something around the 30 to 31 mark, though always make sure that you are prepared to stop addition of your sodium thiosulfate if you notice a color change happen earlier on in this process. As you notice, the brown iodine color is slowly fading. And once it turns yellow, we'll add our starch to generate the blue starch iodine complex. Let's slow the pace. Oh, whoops. Let's slow the pace a little bit. Okay, now we're going to drain in our remaining drop. And now we're going to add our starch solution. So here's our starch and we're going to add our starch. There we go, there's the beautiful color, the beautiful blue color of the starch iodine complex. And now we're going to add at a slow dropwise pace, drop by drop. Okay, there's our first drop. Let's do one more. Okay, we have our second drop and we have half a drop sitting in the tip of our barrette. So let's drain that one down. Almost, this is like almost half a drop until we're, we're done. Okay, here's another drop, swirl, okay, one more, Okay, and let's now drain the half drop that we have sitting in, a, in the tip of our barrette. Okay, another drop. Still nothing. Let's do another drop. It's important to stay patient during this process. Okay, we're approaching our projected endpoint.
almost there. Okay. We're expecting a final volume of around 32. That's why I added in a relatively quick amount. I was just checking my notes and realized I was expecting a volume of around 32 mils instead of 31. Let's continue our dropwise process. Okay. Almost there. Let's rinse down our half drop. We've now reached the end point, so let's now record the final volume of sodium thiosulfate dispensed. Okay, so please record the final volume of sodium thiosulfate dispensed and I'll be taking a picture at this time. Okay, so let's refill our barrette and let's repeat with trials number two and three. So let's do trial number two, so I'm gonna refill our barrette, and then we'll continue from there. Okay, so from this view, whoops, allow me to get it to zoom in properly. And I'll also take a photo. Okay, so I refilled our barrette for trial number three. Please record the initial volume for trial number three for our sodium thiosulfate standardization. Okay, so we have our third Erlenmeyer flask. So just like before, we're going to transfer 25 milliliters of our potass potassium iodate solution. So. Here's our potassium iodate solution. Remember, I already conditioned my pipette. You always need to make sure your pipette is conditioned before you transfer solutions, especially because this is the primary standard. So if it's diluted, all of our calculations will be thrown off. So we're gonna fill and then drain to the 25 milliliter mark. Okay, so let's now drain to the 25 milliliter mark.
Okay, so we've drained so the bottom of the meniscus is exactly touching the 25 milliliter mark. And now let's process this solution. So, just like before, we are going to add our potassium iodide, 2 grams, and our sulfuric acid, 10 milliliters. And remember, once we add our sulfuric acid, we're on a timer. So I'm going to add my potassium iodide. swirl and now let's generate our iodine via addition of sulfuric acid this is an acid facilitated redox reaction it's run under acidic conditions okay so now we have the beautiful iodine color so now we are going to titrate so we're going to add at a pretty brisk pace up until we've dispensed approximately 14 milliliters. Okay, so now we're going to slow our pacing a little bit, and now we're going to do a dropwise addition. Okay, so now that we have our yellow color in place, we are going to add our starch. So here's our beautiful starch solution. So let's add our starch. And we generate the blue color of our starch iodine complex. OK. And we have about 0 0.8 mils until our expected endpoint. So let's do a dropwise addition. Beautiful. So now we're at our end point, and it took us about approximately 15 milliliters. So all of our runs are relatively reproducible. So I'm going to now go up to our barrette, and please take a reading for the final volume in our barrette, and I'll take a picture as well. We'll talk next about how to prepare the bleach solutions, and then we'll talk about how we'll titrate our bleach solutions. Okay, so now we have our deionized water. We have a hundred mil Erlenmeyer flask. Oh, sorry, hundred mil volumetric flask. And we have our commercial bleach solution. This is great value bleach. This is our liquid bleach. Now, we can't just go and titrate this directly. Instead, we have to dilute our commercial bleach sample by a factor of 10. So we're going to take 10 mils of our liquid bleach and dilute it to a final volume. 
of 100 mils. So uh, first things first, and this is a key thing, we are actually diluting our bleach. Some students forget to dilute their bleach and wonder why it's taking them 200 mils to reach their endpoint. And we have a 10 mil pipette. If you pay attention, you'll notice that the 10 mark is above the tip of the pipette, so we're gonna drain only so the bottom of the meniscus is at the 10 mark, not past the 10 mark. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna condition our pipette. So we're gonna draw in a small volume of our solution. Oh. And then we are going to coat the inner walls. I apologize for doing it off camera, but the seal isn't perfect with my fingers. So I'm coating the inner walls and then draining the solution. And I'm gonna condition about two more times and we'll resume once I've completed conditioning. Okay, so we've completely conditioned our pipette. Now we're going to fill our pipette all the way to the zero mark and then drain to the 10 mark to dispense 10 mils. Okay, and then just to verify that we are in fact at the zero mark, there we go. Okay, so let's drain and transfer 10 mils of solution. Just as a side note, you want to make sure all of the solution enters and is not stuck on the side of your volumetric flask. Perfect, so we've drained exactly to the 10 mark. I apologize for the angle, but the, but the bottom of the meniscus is actually directly at the 10 mark. Okay, we drain the rest of our solution. It served its use. Okay, and now we are going to dilute the solution to the line with our boiled water. And we'll top it off with our deionized boiled water present in our squirt bottle. Okay, so we filled the line. Now what we're going to do is we're going to cap and thoroughly mix this solution to ensure it's homogeneous. And we'll resume after we've thoroughly mixed this solution. Okay, so I've taken the liberty of transferring the bleach, some of the bleach solution in our Erlenmeyer flask into a beaker so we can transfer using our volumetric pipette. I cleaned out all my Erlenmeyers. They don't need to be dry in a titration because the volume of water does not change the moles of each species that reacts. That's a beautiful thing about titrations. 
Now I've also refilled our barrette, so I'm gonna go up and for trial one of our bleach, I would like you to record the initial volume. Here we go. Please record the initial volume of sodium thiosulfate solution in our barrette for our first titration run of the liquid bleach solution. I'll also take a photo. Okay, so as we, as previously, I've done some work and prep work to make these three runs go smoothly. So I have my three samples of potassium iodide. I have my three samples of starch in the black. I have my sulfuric acid already prepared. And now all I have to do is pipette over 25 milliliters of this one to 10 diluted solution of bleach. Okay. So let's take our volumetric pipette, and just as a side note, we're gonna to need to condition our 25 mil cleaned volumetric pipette. So just like before, we're going to draw in a small volume and then we're going to use that small volume to coat the walls of our pipette. Don't forget to condition. It may seem like a superfluous step, but it has a pretty pronounced effect on the reproducibility of your results. So we will condition two more times and then resume. Okay, Oops. one moment. Okay, so we have our conditioned volumetric pipette. So now we're going to fill to the zero mark and then drain to the 25 mark to transfer 25 milliliters of our liquid bleach solution. Oops. We need a little bit more from our stock. Okay, so we have it filled to the zero mark. Now let's drain to the 25 mark. Oh, whoops. A little bit was lost. Okay, so we have it filled to the zero mark. Now we'll drain to the 25 mark. Okay, so we've drained down to the 25 mark. And now we'll resume when we talk about processing our solution. Okay, so we have our barrette already prepared with our sodium thiosulfate solution. We have an Erlenmeyer flask containing our bleach solution. And now we are going to add our potassium iodide 
which will generate iodine after it reacts with the sodium hypochlorite. And then we will add our sulfuric acid to facilitate the reaction further. Now we're on a time limit, so we're going to begin titration of this solution with our standardized sodium thiol sulfate. Once we get close to the end point, then we will add our starch indicator, and we will then be able to continue titrating until that blue, beautiful blue color disappears. So we're going to start with a brisk dropwise addition. adjust the view so it's a little easier to see. There we go. It's a bit of a slow process, but as long as we're keeping the dropwise addition, we'll be fine. The first run is really just helping us get a sense of what volume of sodium thiosulfate do we need for a complete reaction. Now, if you forgot to dilute your bleach, you just see this giant lump of iodine generated, which would take a lot of sodium thiosulfate. So this, the 1 to 10 dilution is really critical for this experiment, and remember to account for that in your calculations. So we're, we've already dispensed around 13 mils. I'm not seeing any abatement of our iodine color, but that's okay. We'll continue until we start to see the color to lighten, and then we'll add our starch indicator. If you didn't thoroughly mix your bleach solution, you'd also end up with inconsistent results. That's why you must need to make sure all of your solutions are thoroughly mixed when you do a dilution. Okay, we're almost there. It takes a fairly large volume. That's why we did the dilution. Bleach is relatively concentrated sodium hypochlorite. It's around, I believe it's around 5% by mass typically. So it varies depending on the manufacturer. And patience is a virtue. There's no need to rush. Our first trial is exploratory in nature. But you don't want to add the starch too early, or it becomes hard to see these subtle color changes 
as the amount of iodine drops in the solution. As you notice, the color is getting lighter and lighter. We are approaching our end point. So now we are ready, now we are ready to add our starch. And there's that beautiful blue color. It's always fun to look at. This is textbook iodometry in motion. So let's now switch to a slow dropwise addition. Okay, so we are very, very, very close to our end point, and that little half drop was all it took. So here we go. So it took approximately 28 milliliters. So let's now zoom in, and I'd like you to take your final volume reading for our first trial of our liquid bleach solution titration. And I'll also take a photo. Okay, so let's refill our barrette and let's repeat with trials number two and three. So let's do trial number two. So I'm going to refill our barrette and then we'll continue from there. Okay, so from this view, whoops, allow me to get it to zoom in properly. And I'll also take a photo. Okay, so please record the initial volume for trial two of our liquid bleach titration. Now, we know that it's going to take roughly 28 milliliters of sodium thiosulfate. So let's prepare our bleach solution. Again, I have already conditioned my volumetric pipette. So all I need to do is transfer 25 milliliters of my liquid bleach diluted solution, not concentrated bleach, into my Erlenmeyer flask. So we fill to the zero mark and then drain to the 25 line. Oops, one moment. Let's dispense a little bit more of our solution. Okay, so we filled 
the zero mark. Now let's drain. So we filled, so the bottom of the meniscus is at our zero mark. Now let's drain to the 25 mark. Okay, so we've drained, so the bottom of the meniscus is at our 25 mark. We'll pause and then we'll discuss treatment of the solution so we can begin our titration. Okay, so we have our bleach solution. This is for trial two. We're now going to add our two grams of potassium iodide as well as our 10 mils of sulfuric acid. Okay, so let's get this process started. Let's get our solution prepared. We mix in our potassium iodide. We see the beautiful iodine color start to appear. And now let's add our sulfuric acid to truly facilitate this redox reaction. Okay. So now that we have our solution prepared, we're going to begin titration. And we're going to start with a really brisk pace because we know it's going to take roughly 28 mils. Okay, so as we've dispensed 19 mils, we're now going to switch to a brisk dropwise addition. Just so that way if we see any surprises, we have enough time to react. and we're looking for the color to slowly start to fade and once we see the yellow color or light orange color then we will add our starch. Okay, so we're getting very close to our end point. So now let's add our starch. And now let's continue with our slightly slower paced dropwise addition. Okay, our color is starting to fade. We only need about half a drop more likely. So let's rinse that down using 
our boiled deionized water squirt bottle. Okay. Almost, all we need is like half a drop and then we're good. So let's very carefully dispense half a drop. There we go, and this is really shows how much a drop can make a difference. We are now at our end point, so let's record our final volume. Okay, please record the final volume after titration of our second trial of our liquid bleach solution, and I'll be taking a photo as well. Okay, so I have taken the liberty of refilling our barrette. Please record the initial volume for trial three of our liquid bleach. With that established, there's also going to be a photo on canvas. We're now going to transfer 25 milliliters of our liquid bleach solution using our conditioned volumetric pipette. Okay. So we're going to fill to the zero mark and then drain to the 25 mark. Okay, so I filled to the zero mark. Now let's drain down to the 25 mark. Okay, so we've drained down to the 25 mark, and we'll pause and we'll talk about how to process these solutions now. Okay, so we have our 25 milliliters of bleach solution. We've recorded the initial volume of sodium thiosulfate in our barrette. We're now going to add our potassium iodide in order to generate the iodine that we titrate. And remember, from the amount of iodine generated, we can calculate the amount of sodium hypochlorite present in our bleach solution. Note, present in our dilute bleach solution, just as a hint for your calculations later on. So, here is our Erlenmeyer flask after we've added our potassium iodide and our sulfuric acid. We now have the beautiful color of iodine, and now we're going to titrate at a brisk pace since it takes roughly 28 mils. We're going to go pretty quick for the first 25 mils. Okay, so now that we've added our first 25 mils, we're going to switch to a brisk dropwise addition.
And once we see the light orange yellow color, then we will add our starch to generate the starch iodine complex. Okay, so now we have a wonderful yellow color. We're going to add our starch solution. And we have the beautiful blue color of the starch iodine complex. And now we're going to switch to a very slow dropwise addition. Okay, and we slightly overshot the end point, but this is within, within one to two drops, so it's a reasonable run. Um, if the data is truly outside, um, you can perform a Q-test just to verify if this data is or is not an outlier. Um, okay, so let's now record our final volume, and I'll also be taking a picture at this time. Okay, so I spent the past few minutes grinding up our powdered bleach because we're now analyzing solid powdered bleach. I went at it with a mortar and pestle, and now it's a little more finely ground than when we started. I'm going to dispense about five grams of this solid powdered bleach, so I'd like you to record the mass before I have transferred the bleach. And now I'll transfer five grams onto my way boat, and then we'll dilute this five grams of bleach with 100 mils of deionized water. Okay, please record the mass of solid bleach dispense. And now we are going to move over and talk a little bit about our dilution step. Okay, so we have 100 mil Erlenmeyer, so just like before, we are going to add our solid and then fill to the line with our boiled deionized water. Now, not all the solids will dissolve because powdered bleach has many different components to it, but our sodium hypochlorite should dissolve with thorough mixing. I'm going to place the weigh boat back on the scale and we're just going to record any mass of solid left over in our weigh boat just so that we were 100% sure that we're calculating and using only the mass that actually ended up in our volumetric flask. Okay, so now, with, now that we have that out of the way, now that we have that out of the way, we're going to begin our dilution step. 
So we're going to fill to the line and dissolve as much and dissolve all of our solid with our boiled deionized water. I'm going to get some more deionized water and we'll resume once I've completed this dilution. Okay. And now we're going to top it off with our deionized water bottle that is filled with boiled water. Okay, perfect. Now we're going to thoroughly mix our solution. So we'll resume after I've mixed this solution thoroughly and we'll see what we can see. Okay, so after shaking our solid bleach and trying to dissolve as much of it as possible, we end up with the following solution. Now, many commercial, commercial solid bleach samples have abrasive agents that are not particularly soluble in water. So we're not expecting to see a perfectly homogeneous solution. However, we're going to allow the solution to settle as much as possible. And we are going to avoid drawing in the solid abrasive agent at the bottom of our volumetric flask. We'll then talk a little bit about how we are going to process these solutions and we'll resume with the titration of our solid bleach solution. Okay, so again I've taken the liberty of preparing the three potassium iodide samples we need for our three trials. I have my three samples of starch, I have my three Erlenmeyer flasks, and I have my sulfuric acid in my graduated cylinder. Now uh, before I even think about pipetting into my Erlenmeyer, I am going to have to condition my volumetric pipette before I transfer 25 mils of this solid bleach solution. So just like before, we're going to follow the common procedure for conditioning. And we'll resume. So just like before, we're going to draw in a small volume of sample into our clean pipette. And then we are going to attempt to coat the inner walls of our pipette. I apologize if it's off camera a little bit. I have to make sure that the tip of the pipette is above the waste con up return container. So that way there's no leaks onto the lab bench. We'll repeat this conditioning process two more times and then resume once I've completed conditioning my pipette. Okay, so to prepare our solid bleach solution for titration, I'm going to transfer 25 milliliters of solution using my conditioned volumetric pipette. So I'm going to fill to the zero mark, drain to the 25 mark, Okay, so we filled the zero mark. Let's now drain down to the 25 mark for our first trial.
Okay, so we've drained down to the 25 mark, and we'll continue when we talk about how to process these solutions. Okay, so I've taken the liberty of refilling our barrette. Please record the initial volume for our first trial for our solid bleach solution titration. Now, continuing on from that, we've already transferred our solid bleach solution into our Erlenmeyer flask. We are now going to add the two grams of potassium iodide and our 10 milliliters of sulfuric acid to trigger a reaction to generate iodine, which we will titrate. Again, we see the, the dark brown color Allow me to get sulfuric acid. Okay, so now we have the beautiful color of iodine and now we'll begin our titration. So we're gonna start with a relatively brisk dropwise pace and then we'll go from there. And once we see the light yellow to orange color, then we'll add our starch. And this titration is moving smoothly. It's taking a fair amount of sodium thiosulfate, but nothing that we don't have access to. Okay, as we're starting to see the yellow color appear, we are going to now add our starch solution. Ah, there's that beautiful blue color once again, and now we'll continue titrating at a dropwise pace. Okay, it's starting to clear up, so let's...
there we go. So we got, we're at the end point now. So let's now record the volume of sodium thiosulfate in our barrette at the end of our first trial for our solid bleach solution titration. Okay, so I've taken the liberty of refilling our barrette for our second and final trial for our titration of the solid bleach solution. So please record the initial volume of sodium thiosulfate in our barrette. Okay, so we're now going to prepare our solution. I've already conditioned my pipette, so I'm going to transfer 25 milliliters of my solid bleach solution into my Erlenmeyer flask. So I'm going to fill to the zero mark and then drain down to the 25 mark. Okay, so now we're going to drain down to the 25 mark. Okay, so we've drained the 25 mark, and now we'll, we'll resume when we talk about how to process these solutions. Okay, so let's now process this 25 milliliters of our solid bleach solution. So we're going to add, as always, our 2 grams of potassium iodide to generate the iodine that we titrate, and in turn, by figuring out the amount of iodine generated, we can calculate the amount of sodium hypochlorite in our solid bleach sample. Okay, now we're going to add our sulfuric acid to really facilitate this process. The reaction to generate iodine, the redox reaction, is facilitated in the presence of acid. We are going to mix and thoroughly stir our solution, and now we are going to begin titrating at a quite brisk pace, since we know it takes roughly 30 mils and with that knowledge in mind, we can, in turn, quickly get through the first 28 milliliters of sodium thiosulfate that we need to add. Of course, I'm always keeping an eye out just to make sure that there's no sudden color change, but we're pretty reproducible in our technique. Even though the solution is a little bit heterogeneous, um, it shouldn't be an issue in this case. Okay, so we've dispensed roughly 27 milliliters, and now we're going to do a, br a brisk dropwise addition. Okay, so we observe the light orange color. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add our starch solution. And let's make the starch iodine complex for the last time today. Okay, and now we're going to do a slow dropwise addition.
and there we go. We've reached our end point. So let's now record the volume present in our barrette at the end of our second trial for titration of our solid bleach sample. Okay. Well, that concludes today's experiment. From the data collected, you should be able to calculate the amount of sodium hypochlorite present in both our solid and our liquid bleach samples. Remember to account for dilution. You'll be also provided the density of our commercial bleach solution um, that you will use for your titration. In fact, we'll also take another replicate run where we measure the density of our commercial bleach solution while we're here. Okay, uh, in order to complete our data set, we're going to determine the density of our commercial bleach solution. And the way that we're going to do that is we have a pre teared um, piece of glassware. In this case, I'm using a graduated cylinder. It can just as easily be a beaker. And I'm going to transfer 10 milliliters using my conditioned 10 milliliter volumetric pipette. So I'd like you to note the mass before the 10 milliliters are transferred. I'm going to transfer 10 milliliters of the commercial bleach solution, and then you're going to record the mass at the end of the transfer process. So I'm going to dispense down to the 10 mark. Okay, so we've transferred 10 mils into our piece of glassware. Now I'd like you to note the mass after the 10 milliliters of commercial bleach solution was transferred. And remember, because I used a volumetric pipette, you're going to need to report your sig figs uh, properly for a volumetric 10 milliliter pipette. So you should have around four sig figs, two decimal places. Okay, with that, you have all the data you need to complete your lab report for the bleach laboratory.